The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. So, uh, I'm Nick Everett, and uh, six months ago, when the call for submissions came out, I titled this tour, tour of an Elasticsearch application. The presentation has sort of changed in a little bit in the past six months, but there's tour in there, I promise. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do in the presentation, I'm going to define some basic terms, like Elasticsearch, uh, Nick Everett, um, Wikimedia Foundation, things like that. Uh, I am going to present sort of a, a basic development workflow for Elasticsearch. I'm going to define all the terms that I say again in the, the workflow. And I'm going to relate that to Cirrus Search. And then I'm going to answer some wonderful, insightful questions from you. In fact, uh, you can ask me questions anytime you like. I promise to repeat the question so that it gets recorded. Uh, if I don't, shout at me and I'll remember it. Uh, raise your hand or shout or whatever. And if I make some horrible mistake, like one presentation I forgot to define Elasticsearch, and a guy shouted at me and told me to do that, and he saved the presentation. So if I make such a mistake again, save the presentation for me. OK, so I'm Nick Everett. My job is to replace the on-site search used at the Wikimedia Foundation. So that's uh, wikis like Wikipedia, Commons, uh, well, all the Wikipedia's, right? There's Italian, German, French. I mean, there's eight of them. Right? And there's tons of other things, Wiktionary, Wikisource, Wikinews, lots of it. Um, yeah, so in the process, I've become an Elasticsearch contributor and a minor contributor to Lucene and also to Elastica, which is a PHP library used to communicate with Elasticsearch. Um, so who's used Elasticsearch? One. OK, well, half of you. That's cool. Who's used it in production? OK. Great. So I, I'm going to try to customize the talk a little bit for given that data, but I'm not very good at speaking, so I don't promise much. Um, so you can think of Elasticsearch as a multi-tenant, sharded, replicated, RESTful document store with full text search capability. That's a lot of stuff. Multi-tenant means that there are multiple indexes uh, served out of the same cluster. So these are like totally separate sets of documents. Sharded means that each index is broken up into multiple, broken up into multiple shards and put on multiple machines. Uh, replicated means the shards are replicated on the multiple machines. So you have some degree of fault tolerance. You could lose actually all of the nodes, all of the servers that serve a particular shard, and you could still uh, reply with the shards that you have still running. You get an error message, but. You can still you still get some documents. Uh, RESTful document store means you shove JSON in it with HTTP and ASON, uh, JSON pops out with HTTP. That's probably an abuse of the term RESTful, but it's good enough, and people kind of get the point. Uh, full text search means it has those things: language analysis, relevancy sorting. Um, I can describe them sort of more intimately later. Elasticsearch also has a bunch of other stuff that's really cool that you can look up if you want. Cirrus Search is the MediaWiki plugin that I work on, and it takes data from MediaWiki and squishes it into Elasticsearch, and then takes requests from MediaWiki, like search requests, and turns them into requests to Elasticsearch, and then pushes them back out to the rest of MediaWiki. Uh, the idea is that Elasticsearch and MediaWiki should not know about each other. And so supposedly MediaWiki is the simple wrapper between them. But as you can see, you know, there are some basic searches that it has to serve, like Nobel Prize winners. But there's also some relatively complicated queries that it has to serve, like this query here is a person looking to find pictures of cats that are not in the category pictures of cats so that they can put them in the category pictures of cats. This is something that... Um, people do when they maintain the category hierarchy on commons. Um, I have a guy that talks to me all the time about it. Cirrus search is named after cloud because clouds are buzzwords. 
and we couldn't think of a good name. That is a picture of a cirrus cloud that is way too small for you to see. I'm very sorry, but it's the long stringy kind, sort of a fluffy kind at the top. Uh, the neat thing about the Wikimedia Foundation is that most of the work we do is public. And the public configuration is public, the monitoring configuration is public, and all of the source code, the MediaWiki itself, Cirrus Search, we have an Elasticsearch extension that we use is also public, uh, and Elasticsearch is public, and Scene's public, and all of the libraries on down are public, and everything else we do is that way. There's no secret sauce, the only secrets are the database passwords, pretty much. Uh, well, actually, there are three secret sauces. Four, database passwords, log stash, log files, and a singa. Uh, so our monitoring, we don't have a tool to anonymize the logs. So we have a privacy policy that has us nuke them after a certain period of time, and we only allow people that have signed NDAs to look at them. Thus, I cannot show you our beautiful, beautiful log stash installed. Sorry. So, I just defined a bunch of terms. This is a basic development workflow. It's my opinion. Uh, it's not necessarily what you're going to always follow, or maybe you think I'm totally wrong. But it's what I did. Um, you dump documents in the index, which means you build them at your source system. You write some queries, and if you're right, sweet, you got a drink. If they don't spit out the right answer, there are four things that you might have to change. If you're lucky, you just change the query. Easy. If you're really unlucky, you change the documents and regenerate them at the source system and pitch them back in the, into Elasticsearch. If you're somewhere in between, you change the analysis or the mapping. And what are mapping and analysis, you ask? Well, I will define them right here. First of all, documents. I said, they're JSON. You shove them in. Uh, in um, single or in bulk, and they sort of spring to life, they spring to searchability after a certain configured period of time. Um, there are reasons, but it's not worth going into now. You can look it up if you want. It's called near real time. Anyway, uh, the queries are posted JSON. Yay. Um, they can get really, really big. The one that I send for a regular user text search is a couple of kilobytes. I mean, you would think that this is a problem, and they have a feature that lets you uh, use uh, templates on the server side, and it like evaluates a mustache template and then builds the queries that way. But it really hasn't been an issue for us, the, the size of the requests. Uh, and you post them anyway, so it's not like you're going to hit some weird limit, uh, like from Apache's get limit or something odd. Um, so mapping. Of course you want to know what mapping is. I said that word. So Elasticsearch has types. Um, so let's go look at a document. The document, are you videoing that thing? When you put a document in the index, this thing right here is the index, right? That's, that's how it's multi-tenant. You just choose a different one if you want a different, different index. This is, the type. this is the type. The type is used for segregating different kinds of documents. And so say I want to index wiki pages, which I do. And say I also wanted to index pictures, and they're actually a different thing. In my case, they're not. But say they were, then I would have a different type. I would have a picture type, image type, whatever. And so each type is a key into a different kind of mapping. Each type has a mapping, right? And those mappings define what the fields are on the document. Stop it. Where'd I go? There you go. So see how there's a phrase field in that JSON? So that's one of the fields on that, on the mapping. There can be bunches of them that it can be nested. Um, there's sort of funkiness that goes on when you nest things. You can have multi-valued fields. It's all great. So, and the upshot is that Elasticsearch will create the fields on the fly when you add them in. That's really useful because in a lot of cases, the default analysis works great. It splits on spaces and things like that, and it lowercases the words. Right? That's often what you want to do. Um, yeah. So analysis is how the strings are tokenized. Uh, I have another pretty picture that I didn't put in this presentation that I should have. 
uh, which shows you steps. Like if you have a sentence, it's broken up into words, and then the words are lowercase. You can also configure the analyzers to be more complicated to do things like flatten out uh, like high ASCII characters into the low ASCII characters. You can do things like stem the words, take uh, conjugated English and turn it into its sort of its root form. Um, just a lot of stuff you can do with, with, with analysis. It's done at both index and query time. So when you type your query, the query is analyzed and it's compared, it's analyzed with the same or probably the same indexer as you, or analyzer as you index the documents. And then it just sort of does a lookup to find the text that you're looking for. So the basic workflow is send documents, let the fields be created on the fly, write some queries. That's what I said, right? That's the first, first way down. And that's good enough sometimes. For me, it is totally not. Um, and I, lots of people it won't be. But it's a great way to get started. So when you want to change the mapping, if there's a new field that you haven't already sent, then you can just tell it. You can configure a new mapping with this post here. Put, I guess. I never remember. Um, and if it's a new field, you can just put it in. If you haven't said that field before. You can also uh, add a sort of a, a, a subfield under the same field that analyzes that one field in a different way. And that's free. You can do it at any time. Uh, and, well, not quite any time. But you can do it and then update the documents and it all works. Uh, if field already exists, you pretty much have to rebuild the index. So what you do is this mostly atomic uh, alias swap where you have an alias to one index, to the index that you're actually serving production for. You stream the documents from that index into another one with the new configuration. And then you say, and you switch the alias. That's, it's a distributed system. And it's, I've, never, I've never ever seen it not be like perfectly like clunk swap. But so I, I think it's quite atomic. In any case, uh, when you change analysis, it's the same thing as changing mappings. Same general idea. Like there are a few little tiny differences, but you can look them up on in the documentation. But that's the upshot of it. Time series data has a neat out in that if you are indexing time series data, uh, you tend to create a new index every day. So just put your new settings on the new index and leave the old settings on the old index. Done. The nice part about this is that when you build queries, the analyzer that's used to analyze the text for the query is often configured at index creation time. That means that it's internally consistent in the old index and in the new index, if you did it right. And if you have a bug, then you have to go fix it, right? But hey, that's no fun for me because I don't have that kind of data. And uh, it's a little easier, if a little headachey, because you have to worry about different kinds of indexes. Instead. I have to re-index my data when I change the mapping because wiki pages aren't time, time series data, right? I can't store them in dates. So I have to do this uh, rebuild and swap that I talked about before or insert, the, insert all the documents newly built from the source system. These may collapse. If your source system is quite fast, then you can just create the new index and jam them in there really quickly. My source system is really slow, so I can't do that. I have to stream them from Elasticsearch. So that's what I do. Uh, it takes somewhere between minutes and hours for me. It's about two hours for English Wikipedia. I typically start the process for all 800 of my wikis, go to bed, and then in the morning, I watch them somewhere in like the G's. And then it takes a couple of days to cover all of them. That's okay. It does sort of make the monitoring scripts complain while I do it, but that's too damn bad. Anyway. Um, Oh, the other thing, you have to be really careful when you're doing this that you don't sort of just smash the server because you can configure this to be really, really, really fast, much faster than, than I'm doing it, but at the cost of hurting search performance. And you don't want that because you've got people using, using the index, right? Maybe. That depends on how you, how you work. Um, yeah, the other thing is that because you're making two copies of everything, you're doubling your space usage, right? You, you have to maintain, you have to keep your old copy and your new copy until the swap, and then you can delete the old copy. Or you can keep the old copy for a while in case you want to roll back. Uh, inserting new documents is obviously limited by the source system. And for me, it's like way slower, like 10 days. Slow, 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 slow. Um, so search has to work 
And it has to work when you have multiple different kinds of documents in the system. And you have to live with it. <laughs> um, so the, the nearly atomic ones, yeah, I said all that stuff. Sweet, I can skip this one. Right, did I say all this stuff? Oh, well, I guess, when you release, if you plan on doing the, the nearly atomic like index into the other index and then swap, there is a period where your application is deployed talking to the old index, right? And because you deployed your application to know how to re-index into the new one, which is why you really want to make the old end, the indexes sort of internally consistent. And so you end up with things like features that are disabled with some feature flag that says, when I have finished the indexing, I can do this. And that's actually not all that common because mostly you get, I've gotten to the point where uh, I set the indexes up so that they're internally consistent by setting search analyzers on the fields that I want to query. And so then it just works with the new index and the old one. Testing is kind of hard like that. Um, so I've talked about two different kinds of ways to sort of bulk build your data, but that's not really uh, good enough, cool, hip, whatever. Uh, you really want to get your changes into the system fast, like, so that people can see it. That's one of the big selling points of the project that I'm working on. The old system would rebuild the index every couple of days. This one, if you edit a page within about a minute, the search index has it. And that's really nice. Um, the thing you have to do is to make sure that your real time, one, catches all the changes, which can be hard, and two, you have to make sure that the documents that it builds that it builds are exactly the same as the documents that you build in bulk. Uh, and um, this turned out to be really important for us. Uh, fork the index updates from user requests. Always, always, always fork them. Like, be really, really careful. Make sure you fork them. Because it's really nice, especially when you're first trying out, if you blow up the system accidentally, uh, you'll want to be able to retry these things. Uh, and with a, you know, with a message queue or a job thing, job queue thing, you can do that, right? If it blows up, try again, keep going. Um, and also, if it takes your source system a long time to generate the document, you don't want the user to sit around and wait for that. I work in PHP, like, it's single process, I can't, there's no threads, none of that. So the only thread I have is this job queue thing. So you might, you might have different abilities depending on where what framework, what language you work in. Um, so anyway, I put all of that picture, which I will go back to you and show you. Um, so now you should know all the words in this picture. They should all make sense. And if they don't make sense, I fail. Okay. So. Now I'm going to relate what I said, all of that, that first picture, to uh, Sierra Search, the application that we have. Um, little happy face is MediaWiki. Uh, he is our user stand-in because he translates user requests like either actual search requests, find as you, like find as you type requests, or API requests, translates them all into uh, queries. Uh, the query builder box. Sends, sends queries to Elasticsearch. It uses, we, in our case, we have different kinds of results. Uh, so we have these results type things that know how to uh, tell Elasticsearch what portions to highlight and what portions of the document to return, because I skip by it. But Elasticsearch can filter the source document. So if you have a giant page, if you have a megabyte of source document, you probably don't want you know, the huge megabyte of text to come back. You only want the ID and the title or whatever. And then what you can do is highlight the megabyte of text. So find the hits that you have and only present the user with the interesting bits, right? And so this is all stuff that the results type configures. And sometimes if you're find ahead as you type, you don't want to go and highlight. That takes time, right? So you just want to spit out the, the title, right? So that's pluggable there. Um, we also have an so going left to this index settings updater, uh, that's green, but impossible to read green. Um, it's, it is a PHP script for me. Uh, and I'm pretty firmly in the camp that this should be a script that you run manually. 
and you should be able to watch it, log it, watch it do its thing. It's, it shouldn't be some sort of uh, thing that happens when you deploy and just happen on everything because you want to be able to stage these and have control over them. So this is, by the way, the thing that changes the mapping. Maybe, it, so you know, in my case, it builds that extra index and then does the, the suck out of the old one and push into the new one and then the swap. So that's all a PHP server, right? Um, going left again, there's the real-time updater component. Uh, technically, the little happy face talks to the real-time updater too. Um, error's missing, sorry. Uh, and so I try to notice all the document changes, things like page moves, page renames, uh, which are different things. Um, and you know, page changes, changes to the templates that are included in pages, deletions, all that stuff, right? So uh, there's a relatively large amount of things that I have to try to notice in my system. That real-time updater always, always, always pushes the, the update into the job queue. There's, going left again, there's a bulk indexer. The bulk indexer uses virtually the same jobs as the real-time updater. It can either push them in the job queue or execute them in process. Uh, we use the job queue almost exclusively, but in test and development, and I suppose any other users of CRS probably wouldn't use it because they don't have as big of a job queue as the foundation does. Um, the updater dude over here, above the job queue's database C disky circle, uh, the updater guy, he knows how to send documents to Elasticsearch, send deletes, all that stuff, uh, and he delegates over to uh, other classes to actually build the documents. It's, it's too much code to find out how to build the documents correctly uh, as well as communicate to Elasticsearch. It's just too, too much all at once. So, and also, often you end up with documents that vary slightly depending on their contents and you want different fields or different whatevers, right? And so you want to be able to sort of plug that in. So, does that make sense? No one said no, so I'm going to go with yes. Um, so, exactly what I thought. I've run through everything I wanted to say in 35 minutes. Um, and now I will hopefully answer questions for the next 25. Uh, here are some examples of wonderful, insightful questions you can ask me if you can't think of any. Um, so please, go ahead. Yes! Hello. Hello. Um, uh, are, are you aware of the uh, Call Me Maybe blog post? I saw the Call Me Maybe blog post last night. It was really I, hard to read. I'm trying to speed read it right now, so I haven't caught up. But I, I get the sense that the, he's pointing out some potential issues with uh, network failures. Is, have you had any issues with ne network failures, and how do you deal with them? No. OK. I've literally had no issues with network failures in my production environment. We have a, we don't, like, we, we don't use virtual machines, right? We're entirely physical. Our network is hardware. Um, so the Call Me Maybe post uh, is something some guy posted a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, and it's really, really hard to read in that there are dancing GIFs in, in off to the side of Barbies and stuff. Um, but his point is that Elasticsearch does not do a great job of quorum management and uh, it doesn't handle network partitions particularly well. Um, Guilty? Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't. It, it does not do, like for example, if you have two shards, a quorum of two is actually one in the current code. Uh, and that's silly, but maybe useful. Um, realistically, like the takeaway from, from that, is, from the Call Me Maybe blog post, uh, and again, I skimmed it last night, and I was up late and tired and writing presentations, so maybe I lost a lot of it, but. The takeaway is, if there is a network failure, you will lose data. And you really should be able to regenerate that data if you use the system, right? Elasticsearch is not a, an authoritative data source. It is not a relational database. Uh, yeah, they do F-sync your rights, uh, and they do have quorum. Mm -hmm. But uh, at least with what he's posted, uh, it, it looks like I wouldn't trust it for that. And so to be fair to the Elasticsearch folks, and as, 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 a, as a contributor, I kind of want to defend it a little bit. I don't work on that section, but whatever. Um, there are two, like they, 
well, two points. Elasticsearch is actually one of the best tested applications I've ever seen. Uh, Lucene may be, Lucene I think is slightly better tested, but its scope is a lot smaller. It's a Java library, not a Java system like that does all this stuff. Uh, so the scope of Elasticsearch sort of encompasses it in a, in a way. Um, and uh, Lucene came up with some great testing tricks, right? They use randomized testing. They're the ones that find all these bugs in the JVM. Uh, and Elasticsearch uses those. And it's very, Elasticsearch is very integration testy. So if you want to test something, they typically spin up three nodes and then launch queries at it. Sometimes that's frustrating because it's a little slow to run the tests. But you really do get a good sort of sense of the system, right? And they have and have been for months working on improving Zen, the, the, uh, the default system that handles that quorum and handles uh, communicating that data. Uh, so they've been working, they've been working on this. Uh, you know, they have things in, in this branch that they're working on. They have a test that simulates catastrophic network failures and things like that. Um, and frankly, I don't know where they are on that. I haven't asked. Uh, we haven't seen it. There are uh, two Elasticsearch plugins that offer three that offer uh, that offer a, a different um, cluster state management systems, or rather, cluster state management communications and quorum reaching systems. The cluster so you can actually the cluster state itself is a big immutable Java object that's sort of serialized and thrown across the wire. Uh, there, there are, it's pluggable, right? How, the, the throw across the wire and determine that that, that that new cluster state is validness is a pluggable thing. So there's a, a version of it that works with Amazon. Uh, I don't remember whether that's still a plugin or whether that's built in now. Um, there's the one that's built in Zen, which uh, uses either IP uh, multicast or unicast to discover friends, and then they shout at each other um, on port 9300 or thereabouts. Uh, there's another one that uses Zookeeper, which is very strong for Quorum, and there's another one that uses uh, a Scala uh, Quorum maintenance system that a guy's been using, and he actually commented on the, the Call Me Maybe blog post and said, I don't see these problems with my, uh, with my Quorum maintenance thing. Um, now, keep in mind, there, there are actually two kinds of Quorums that you have to reach in Elasticsearch, and it's kind of, kind of weird. There's cluster state Quorum, and that's things like what shard is on what machine and uh, which of the replicas of that shard is the master for that shard. And then there are, then there's actual shard quorum, which is like when you write a document to the index, if you've got writes configured for quorum, then it has to hit a uh, number of replicas over two plus one, right? Or n number of replicas round up uh, nodes. Except, as I said, when you have two, apparently it's one. And someone's been complaining about that. And frankly, that is a little weird to me. But hey, uh, we, use, uh, we, we keep two replicas. And so that means three total copies of the data. So we don't, we don't at least see that problem. Um, but yeah, the Call Me Maybe blog post is, I don't know, I, I read that. And I'm like, man, if only you'd spent that much time writing a usable test case as opposed to this other thing, which, right? If, if, if you had written a usable, reproducible test case, or maybe he has, I don't know, because um, it looks relatively reproducible, then you know, it's something that people can work on, right? And it, yeah. That, that's where I am on that. And we haven't, we haven't had any problems with it. But it, we know that it's possible, right? And we have, we have system, like, uh, uh, see the bulk indexer? His, he has settings so he can index the whole wiki. He can index pages that have changed since a certain date, index it, or pages that have deleted since a certain date. He's got all this stuff, and that was the first thing I built when I, when I started working on the bulk indexer, which was actually the first thing I built in the project, which probably is what you should do too if you start using Elasticsearch, um, because you want to get that data in there to query. Um, and you can query using like just curl. Anyway, um, th that was one of the first things I built because I figured I would make some mistake and screw up the index, and it would be, it would go in some unwritable state. And I, I mean, I did at some point. I had configured Elasticsearch to have zero replicas, and then I shut down a machine without moving all the shards off of it. Well, shit. 
I mean, oh God, we lost everything. Like we lost everything that was on that, that node. In fact, I was repartitioning that node, right? So we deleted everything on it. We didn't even restart the machine. We nuked it before we realized the problem. So, I mean, I guess let that be a lesson to you. Make sure that you actually have replicas. Because um, I didn't once. Once. Never. I have replicas. Two replicas all the time now. Three total copies. Any other questions? Do you want to see code? Do you want to ask me one of these questions that I so insightfully uh, put on there? Because I expected this. Go. Uh, sure. Um, so, no, go ahead. I'll repeat the question. Okay. So, one of the issues that I've seen with with our users running Elasticsearch is <clears throat> running out of file descriptors. So, um, can you tell me anything about tuning? Are there ways to run it? And maybe it'll take longer to do its indexing if you have access to a file script or something like that, or is that just not tunable? It is tunable, uh, but. The question. Oh, sorry, Re repeat the question. See, I, I promise. I even said it. So the question is Elasticsearch can, uh, has trouble with running out of file descriptors. He's seen it uh, happen. I've seen people complain about it on the internet. I've never seen it happen personally. I am reasonably sure the reason I've never seen it personally is that I use the deb installation for the Debian package for Elasticsearch and that comes with the appropriate raise the file descriptors to some egregious level uh, setting in you know Etsy sys whatevers um, and honestly that's the easiest way to handle it is to just raise raise the number of file descriptors to an egregious level because that's Lucene likes file descriptors and Elasticsearch sort of compounds that by having by being multi-tenant and multi-shard and so each each one of those uh, shards is in fact a Lucene index from Lucene's perspective and each one of those likes to have lots of files and so each each Lucene index is often made up of you know 10, 15, 20, 30 segments and each of those segments is five, six, eight files Sometimes. Sometimes they're one file if they want to save file descriptors. So there's a, there's a tweak that you can do that says, hey, Elasticsearch, the segments really should be one file rather than eight files. And that'll save you about an order of magnitude on uh, file descriptors. And it's called compound index format. That's the thing to Google uh, or to search on their site. Um, just raise the number of files. It's slower to use the compound index format. That's next. Solar versus Elasticsearch. Good job. Thank you. Uh, did I have that up there? I thought I did. What, oh, there it is. Um, so, I had actually three using Lucene directly. Um, so, Solar is a very, very, is a project that's very, very close to Apache Lucene. When you check out Apache Lucene, which is the upstream of Elasticsearch, Apache Lucene actually implements half those things, three quarters of the things that I put on the first slot and less of the things on the second slide that I skipped really fast. Um, but Lucene is a Java library that does this full text indexing stuff. And um, so Solar actually lives in the same source tree as Lucene. So in the SBN checkout, boom, there's Solar right there. And you compile them at the same time if you want with Ant, great. Um, so Solar is at least when I, when I was playing with it nine months ago, and I don't know exactly if it's changed a lot, Solar is, is more based on, like, when you, when you configure that mapping and that analysis stuff that you do with Elasticsearch, so the way the fields are, are laid out and the way the fields are split into words, that's configured by dumping an XML file on the hard disk in Solar. And that's significantly more painful from my perspective um, to, to work with. Um, so, like, that right there was sort of like one nail in the coffin for me for Solar. Um, the interesting thing is Solar is very good. It's very fast. It has lots of nice things about it. And in many cases, they sort of take ideas from one another. Um, you know, things like uh, Elasticsearch has a rescore, had rescores, and that flowed back into Lucene, which flowed back into Solar. Um, you know, th things like that. Elasticsearch comes with deb packages and RPM packages uh, and a nice, nice Windows installer there is. So, um, it's a little, I think the, 
the sort of the sysadmin style support is a little better for it. The other thing is that um, sysadmin folks really like Logslash and Kibana, which are uh, log viewers. They're a lot, a lot like Splunk. Um, and so I actually had, I had I actually started the project using Solar Cloud, which is why it's called Cirrus Search, because it's a cloud. Uh, Solar Cloud has similar capabilities to Elasticsearch, and Solar Cloud is just like a solar feature that is in the newer version of Solar. Uh, and I switched to Elasticsearch after sort of working with it and seeing the, po like the posts to update the settings. And, um, well, actually, after, having, after submitting a patch to Elasticsearch and the fact that they jumped on it really quick and worked with me, well, that was really wonderful. Uh, so, you know, I like that community. So, the other thing is that, um, sort of comparing Solar and Elasticsearch versus using Lucene directly. Uh, if you directly use Lucene, you can actually take a few shortcuts and make some things faster by sort of like, oh, I don't need to do this thing if I found this because I'm at a really, you know, I'm actually writing Java code to communicate with it. The trick is, one, you have to write Java, and if you don't like that, you, well, you have to write in the JVM, and if you don't like any of the JVM languages, then it's not going to work out for you. Uh, secondly, there's a lot of sort of debugging stuff that you can do with Elasticsearch that's really, really nice, and you wouldn't be able to do if you just wrapped Solar yourself, or rather you'd have to go to a lot of effort. In Elasticsearch, you can just use it like a document store. Like, you can just get a document via its ID and just get it back and look at it, right? This is really, really useful for debugging. Like, why, can, why is this thing not showing up in the search results? Why is it being highlighted funny? Why is it da da da? Right? And it's really nice to be able to just go get that. You can do that with Solar as well, right? And so, like, that is, that's a pretty killer difference compared to just hand rolling something with Elasticsearch. The other thing is, is the ability to sort of modify the queries on the fly, and by that I mean just like type them straight into, a, into like a, a browser plugin that communicates with it, or uh, deploy a new PHP application with different queries. That's a lot faster than deploying a new Lucene application. So that's that. I filled up 49 minutes. That's actually pretty good for my hour. So if we want to be done, we can be. Or I can ring another question. Yes? What's the future uh, roadmap for Elasticsearch? I don't know. Uh, they, so Elasticsearch, uh, Elasticsearch, uh, all of the mergers for Elasticsearch work for, the, work for Elasticsearch, the company, right? Um, so. As far as I as far as I know, they they are doing things like um, I I sort of can only infer from the past, right? Uh, they may have a roadmap, but I do not know what it is. Uh, my relationship with them has been: I want this thing. Uh, I will go post a post a GitHub issue, and they will either implement it or I will implement it, and they will work with me to get it merged. So. Uh, at least from my perspective, Elasticsearch's roadmap is what I want it to be if I'm willing to sort of work on it or work with them to get it in. Um, so I know that they are working on, because I have talked to them, I know that they are working on um, a system. So one of the complaints about Elasticsearch is that when you restart a node, it takes quite a while to recover the shard back to itself. And they're working on a system that should make that significantly faster. Uh, sequence IDs for updates and things like that. Uh, that should help a lot, and and that is actually one of my pain points. And uh, so I, I'm very glad they're working on that. Um, beyond that, uh, the new version of Elasticsearch uh, is going to shift to Groovy as a scripting language because it's much better sandbox than MVL and is actually a ton faster right now. Um, I used to. Like, I used to think of Groovy as sort of the slow cousin of all of those other ones, but it's gotten way, way faster. So it's, it's the default scripting language that they're moving to. Um, but again, this is sort of near-term near stuff. Like, this is sort of what's coming in Elasticsearch 1.3, which is coming at some unknown date in the future, a couple of months, something like that, right? So, um, you know, they, I know that they do not have things like, you know, mandatory monthly releases and things like that. Uh, you know, they, they release things when they're ready and when they have good enough important things in them. It 
so I know you can't show us specific information because of the privacy policy, but could you show us Kibana or anything about it and how it plugs in? Because I played with it, but I'd like to see it a little more than just the demo package, if you have that. No, I can't show you that. Because that's, I mean, it literally, like, it, the first view you go to it is here are all the exceptions that come up, and those potentially could contain usernames and IP addresses, uh, if, d depending on how they're written, right? Because, we're, again, we're not super clean about it. So, uh, that is literally the thing I cannot show you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Maybe I can show you the one in labs, but I don't remember how to log into it. Um, uh, but, and, and again, I actually don't know. Labs is sort of, it's sort of a weird environment that we had. Um, so I'm not sure that I could even show you that because, of the, because it's, it's technically a, an open beta environment. And again, um, I don't think I can help. I'm really sorry. Uh, it, I will tell you that uh, we use it every time we deploy to check to see if we've deployed something that's broken. Um, it's updated, again, because of the near real time stuff, like it's updated every second. So, uh, you know, I, so we push code three times, uh, three, maybe four or five times a day, uh, four days a week. Uh, sometimes I push the code, right? Um, we have a, a deploy that happens for bug fixes in, in the morning San Francisco time. It's quite early their time, so I typically do it because I'm out here. Uh, and not, I don't always do it. But in any case, uh, I do it enough that you know, the first thing I do is open up Kibana and look at it and check to see what the baseline is uh, for things going wrong. Because there's always a little bit going wrong um, to a degree, right? And then I push the code, and I'll know whether it got better or got worse. And in most cases, it doesn't change, which is good. But that's exactly what you want. You don't want more things going wrong. So I mean, we use it. It works. Um, yeah. Do you have more? Yeah. So I see that question, and it's kind of making me think, what, which Elasticsearch API should I use? So what, what's available? Because I've been feeding it manually. So, so there, are three, there are three Elasticsearch uh, APIs. And by that, I mean there are three ways that you can wire protocol communicate with Elasticsearch. And that's a lie. There are actually more than three. But the, the only three of them are actually widely used. And realistically, only two of them are widely used. The third one is you can, you can send it thrift, um, which I've had bad experiences with Thrift. Facebook loves Thrift, good for them. Um, it, this is, there's a, Facebook, there's a plugin for Elasticsearch that uh, implements Thrift and is supposed to be quite low, low overhead, um, but I don't see a lot of people use it. Um, you can communicate with Elasticsearch using its native API or with JSON. Most of the examples are written in JSON. About 80% of the tests are written using the native API. And a lot of them are written also using JSON, 20%, right? And so the choice is really, really easy between the two if you're not using a, J, a JVM application. If you're not using a JVM application, you're using JSON. Because you can't use a native API because the native API is literally boot a small copy of Elasticsearch inside your application and connect to an Elasticsearch node. And when you do that, you sniff cluster information from it. And the native API can do things like more intelligently route uh, your, your documents into the appropriate place. Like the, the JSON API, when you submit a document, the, do, the server that you submit it to has to then route it to the appropriate machines, right? But your, the native API can sniff the cluster state, and it knows what the appropriate machines to route the requests to are. So when you do it, it submits directly there. The trouble with the native API is that it is a small version of Elasticsearch. And so you have to do things like, um, you have to worry about wire protocol compatibility. And Elasticsearch is actually quite good about wire protocol compatibility. But um, like, for example, you don't want to run different versions of the JVM. You have to run the same version of JVM on the client side and server side. Similarly, you have to run the same version of JVM on all the Elasticsearch nodes. And technically, it's okay to do like a rolling restart to get the new versions of the JVM on there, right? 
Because this is how you upgrade Elasticsearch. You don't want to shoot all the nodes and then bring them all back up. Uh, you do them one at a time, right? And a rolling restart is okay. It's just that uh, sometimes exceptions, sometimes errors are not thrown between the servers correctly if you're not on the same version as JVM. The other thing is that the, 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 they take care to make the, the, the native API compatible, but if you don't want to upgrade your application whenever you upgrade Elasticsearch, uh, like if you want those to be very broken, like very distinct operations, then you should you certainly use the JSON API. If you are okay with a rolling restart of Elasticsearch and then a rolling restart of your application, then native API is great. It's fast. And is there a performance difference between native versus JSON? Yeah, the native API is faster. It's, again, th there's lower overhead on the nodes that you communicate with because you always communicate to the right one. You don't have to use one as a forwarder. Um, you can sort of get around that by spawning a small node um, that is not a data node and is not a master node or cannot be either one of them uh, on, your, on your server. And then you can send requests directly to it and then it will sort of act like the native API, um, which is actually, like when you use a native API, you're doing just that, but inside the JVM. So again, there's, it's lower overhead to use the native API, uh, but I'm not sure how significant it is. It would be things like lower round trip times and uh, slightly decreased load on the Elasticsearch servers, but I don't know how slight. So it's basically it's a lower load versus a looser, a looser coupling between the application and the... Yes, it, you, it's a, it is an exchange of tighter coupling with for Mm, excuse me, exchange of tighter coupling for some speed that I don't actually know how much it is. It could be pretty significant if you have tons and tons of data. Uh, Logstash, I believe, uses the native API, but now that I say that, I'm not actually sure because I haven't looked. But a Logstash is a Java application. JRuby. Yes, uh, you can give me mic and I'll repeat the question. Or no, I won't have to repeat the question. Sorry. Can you talk a little bit about load balancing the JSON interface? Yeah, so we actually put Elasticsearch behind a load balancer because that makes it really easy for us to add new nodes to the Elasticsearch cluster. And then uh, they'll sort of automatically, uh, the request will automatically get round robined out to them. Again, if you use the native API, um, your application sort of load balances on its own, right? It knows which machines to talk to, so great. Um, if you don't, you, if you're using the JSON interface, you, your application has to pick a server to talk to, or your application has to talk to a load balancer that picks a server to talk to, in our case, right? And then uh, that server will receive your request and it will forward it out to the appropriate server. So if you have 20 shards that live on 20 servers, it for, forwards your request out to servers. And it pretty much forwards the same request out verbatim, right? And then they know how to execute the, the thing, right? Um, the search. So there are some folks that use nodes, like I said, they, they run a non-data, non-master node. So a node that cannot be elected a cluster master and a node that cannot, uh, that cannot hold data on its disk, right? You, th these are just configuration things that you can do. And then you can forward all your requests to those nodes, right? And then they will do the load balancing for you. Uh, if, if load balancing looks like a problem, and I'm actually not sure how you'd know that it is, uh, then that's something you should really look at. You should look at either getting a little stable of these, these things or running one directly in on the machine, right? Uh, so in my case, I'd run it next to every Apache. But we're not going to do that because we have hundreds of Apaches and we don't feel like giving them two gigs of RAM to run Elasticsearch. Um, and again, the actual RAM requirements and disk requirements vary. Um, so this, if you have one of these nodes that's an, a non-data, non-master node, then its CPU and disk requirements are gonna be totally different from the data nodes. Because the data nodes are doing things like scraping the, like reading the disk to get the appropriate things. They're doing things like, uh, you know, writing, writing new index files. They're merging the index files together. They're doing quite a lot with their disk. These, these query nodes wouldn't be doing anything with their disk. But they would do, uh, they would combine. Like there is that second phase, right? When you send the request off to 20 servers, you have to combine the request back together. And 
pretty much every request to Elasticsearch has this, this thing where there's a combined phase. And if you use a query node, then it would do that. It would, it would do your combining. So that's an option. I've never been able to find out, or I've never found out when is the time that you need that thing, right? Um, Elasticsearch has a great um, API where you can look at hot threads, and it will do a, uh, like a sort of self-inspection on the JVM, uh, and it'll find out which threads are consuming lots of resources, and it'll do, uh, it'll take snapshots of them, and then collapse them together in sort of a useful way of seeing things. Um, and so you can tell things like, wow, this machine is spending a lot of time merging some things, or wow, this query is taking a really, really long time. And then you can go and, and debug it. It's really great for debugging things that seem to take a lot longer than you expect, but it's not quite as useful for when lots of tiny things are coming in, figuring out what the expensive thing is there. Then standard JVM profiling stuff is what you have to do. But I have not seen any of the, the merge or the load balancing actions be high on that list in my system. Other questions? None. That's cool too. Okay, well, I'm done then. Oh, ah! I have stuff. <laughs> I put it there. Uh, both the foundation and um, Elasticsearch sent me some nice stuff stickers and postcards and buttons. You know, you want a button. Um, and the standard things, uh, the, the Wikimedia Foundation is always hiring. Um, and Elasticsearch, I imagine, is as well. Now I'm done. You can clap, please. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.